Amen to that. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. It, it is Pauline's 90th birthday today. <laughs> Well, good morning to all of you, and welcome to worship at College Mennonite Church. I'm especially proud of each and every one of you who are here and who are tuning in right now and remembered that today we spring forward in time. So it is an extra accomplishment to be where you need to be this morning. Welcome to those of you who are in Goshen, who are around the U.S. or in a different country, who are listening or watching or here in the sanctuary. All of you are welcome in this place. There's a strange miracle that happens when we gather in this way. Even though we can't see everyone who is gathered for worship, there is a thread connecting us all. We are united by a common experience of worship, an experience that is unique to this day and can never be repeated. So use your imagination this morning. Imagine the people and the pets, some of whom you've seen and some you've never seen, who gather today to worship God, the creator of each and every one of us. And with that in mind, join in the call to worship. In the beginning, before time, before people, before the world began, God was here and now, among us, beside us, clearer than air, closer than breathing. God is. In all that is to come, when we have turned to dust and human knowledge has been completed, God will be. Not despairing of earth, but delighting in it. Not condemning the world, but redeeming it through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. God was, God is, God will be. Today's the fourth Sunday of Lent, a time of remembering that we are human, a time of noticing all of the pain and the joy that go along with our humanity. And part of Lent is confession. It's when we come to Jesus with what is on our hearts. Bringing the burdens of our hearts to Jesus helps us make space for who Jesus is calling us to be. So now join in the Song of Confession, which is in Voices Together 736, Hold Us in Your Mercy. And during this song, I invite you at home to light three Lent candles while we have some helpers doing it for us here. As we light these candles and they get dimmer and dimmer every week, we move together into the shadows of Lent. Hold us in your mercy in your mercy hold us in your mercy hold us in your mercy make us love poured out from heaven hold us in your mercy mercy's word made flesh among us hold us in your mercy Born as one of homeless pilgrims, hopeless in your mercy, sent to bring the poor good news, hold us in your mercy. You who shared our life and labor, hold us in your mercy. You who chose to walk our roads, hold us in your mercy. You whose cross has gone before us, hold us in your mercy. You who bear our cross with us, hold us in your mercy. Hold us in your mercy. Hold us in your mercy, hold 
us in your mercy. Hold us in your mercy. Our God of mercy hears our confessions and forgives us and sticks with us. Thanks be to God. Jesus does walk with us on this journey, and Jesus shows up in the people that we encounter along the way. Join now in proclaiming that with the song number 69 in your green Sing the Journey, Cuando el Pobre. God shapes the world by prayer. The more praying there is in the world, the better the world will be. Inspiring words from Mother Teresa. So we join our voices and our hearts in prayer together today, both to express ourselves to God and to listen to God. Please join with me. Gracious God, in the morning when we rise, in the dark of midnight when we cry, you are with us. When we feel completely alone, when we see the dawn, when we prepare to die, you are with us. When we hurt in body or spirit, when we wrestle with deep questions, you are with us. You want to be in relationship with us. For all this, we give you deep thanks. God, we love you. Your love for us makes us bold to join our prayers with all who need your help. You are a refuge for us rich in patience, abounding in love. We pray for our church family and others who are dear to us. 
We bring before you God, Stephen and Donna Priest. We join with them in joy and gratitude as Steve is experiencing remission from his form of leukemia. Continue to enfold them as Steve gains in strength and more possibilities with life activities. God, we also hold Caleb Ganawan and his family in our prayers as Caleb will undergo another round of immunotherapy. Give strength. Fill Caleb with continual courage and bring comfort. God, you also know the journey of others going through cancer treatment, or if not undergoing active treatment, living with the rigors and effects and demands on the body. In each situation, bring the needed strength and care. We also remember Virginia, Irene, and Don as they seek healing, freedom from pain, and renewed strength. God, we love you with our breath and body. Your love binds us together. We pray for our community and neighbors, for those who suffer pain, for those who suffer mental, emotional, or spiritual struggle. We ask that you comfort and encourage each one. For those who are vulnerable to illness or financial strain, neglect or abuse, make yourself known, offering protection, provision, and hope in all forms. God, for those adjusting to changes of our local societal rhythms, as we are experiencing opening up to more gathering and activity, bring guidance. Help us to be grateful, yet still cautious and vigilant about public health. Help us to continue to do all we can to protect the vulnerable. Continue to guide us to see and respect the humanity in each other, even if we are different, while at the same time loving justice, offering kindness, and walking humbly with you. God, we love you with our mind and strength. God, as we consider all the needs and hungers and longings, cries and prayers uttered throughout the world, we are reminded that you neither slumber nor sleep, and we are grateful. You know the pockets of this nation and areas of the world that continue to struggle fiercely with COVID-19. Bring strength and compassion to those who lead. Enfold this wide world in your loving and guiding arms. God, we love you with our whole hearts. And for these shared concerns and many others unspoken, we pray in the name of Jesus, in el nombre de Jesus, Amen. I invite you to join in singing How Can I Say, which is number 388 in Voices Together, as well as 117 in Sing the Story. And children, you are invited to join in children's time, whether you are here or you are elsewhere. Mm. 
How can I say that I love the Lord whom I never, never seen before and forget to say that I love the one whom I walk beside each and every day? How can I look upon your face and ignore God's love? My sister, and I love you with the love of my Lord. How can I say? Welcome to Children's Time. Today's story is a pretty familiar one, so quite a few of you might know it. We're going to act it out here today, and you might want to act it out at home, too. So jump up and join us where you are at home if you would like to. So the story begins with a lawyer wanting to test Jesus, to get Jesus to say something that would get him in trouble. So here's what the lawyer says. Teacher, what do I do to get inside of the blessing? What good deeds should I do? Well, what does it say in the book of the law? How do you understand what scriptures say? It says that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your being, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yep, there you have it. Uh, wait a minute. That lawyer's answer sounded awfully familiar. I saw a few of you starting to say it along with him. Moses says in your new life across the Jordan, love God with your whole heart and with all your being and your strength. Now listen, God is one, only God. Yeah, it's the Shema. So we learned that story like way back in the fall. And this is the story. So the lawyer is saying what parents are told to say to their children every single day. So of course that lawyer knows what to say, but he seems to want to get out of what he knows he needs to do. He's trying to find a loophole. But teacher, who is my neighbor? I'll tell you a story. Then you'll know what it means. All right, so here comes the story. A man was going down from Jerusalem and bandits came upon him and stripped him and beat him up and left him for dead. By coincidence, a priest came along and saw him. But the priest crossed on the other side of the road.
Then a Levite came along and saw the man, but also crossed on the other side of the road. Then a traveling Samaritan, an outsider, came along. He felt the man's pain and wanted to help him. So he came to the man, he cleaned his wounds, he put salve on his wounds and bandaged them up. It's getting the salve out here, I think. Oh, yeah. He's a this thorough a, man. He's, he's being a very thorough salve putter on her. Yep. <laughs> now I think he's got something else to put on there, doesn't he? Yep, there we mm-hmm. go. It's a, it's a Band-Aid. They had those back in Jesus' time, you know? Yep. No, they had bandages, but not the sticky kind. We'll just pretend for this morning. It comes. Which wound is he going to put it on, I wonder? Is it the wound on his head? One on his head or on his hand? Oh, on his jeans. Okay. There we go. He bandaged the man up, put salve on his wounds, and then he helped the man up. It doesn't all want to fit back in there, does it? This is the Samaritan's donkey. Oh, I'm the donkey now? Yeah, okay. you're the donkey now. He helped him up and took him to the nearest town, where they got to an inn. And they found the innkeeper and this Samaritan gave the innkeeper enough money to take care of this man. He gave him enough money for two months for the man to stay there, to get better, so that when he was well, he, might, he would come back again and check on it, and if it wasn't enough money, he'd give some more. And the Samaritan would pay it all. So, now, to your question. Which of these three would you say became a neighbor to the man who was beat up by the bandits? The one who showed him mercy. Oh, that one. Yeah. And there you have it. That's how you should be a neighbor. Now, I have a question. That's how you should be a neighbor. Did Jesus actually answer his question? (laughs) Yeah, Malachi asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus showed him someone who was being a good neighbor. And also, he he didn't answer his first question, but he did even more than that. He didn't tell him how to get inside the blessing. He told him how to live in the blessing. Yeah, he showed him how to live inside the blessing instead of telling him how to get inside the blessing. Yeah. Hmm. In improv, we'd say Jesus did a yes and. He took the question that was asked and pushed it out a little further. Jesus said, hey, you know this stuff. Your parents have been saying this to you your entire life. You know the answers to your own questions, lawyer. But here's how you can put that into action. Well, you know this stuff, too. So how are you going to put it into action? How are you going to be a good neighbor? Let's pray together. God, thank you for these words of love that you have given us, words of love that we are supposed to take in with our entire being and act out every single day. Thank you for all of the neighbors, all of the people that cross our paths in big ways and little ways. We pray that we will know how to be a good neighbor, to put those words of love 
for you and for others into action. In Jesus' name, amen. Our preacher this morning is Phil Waite. He is our pastoral team leader. Join me in a prayer of blessing. God, thank you for your servant, Phil. Thank you for his faithful study of your word, for his curiosity about where your spirit might be blowing, and for the way that he faithfully walks with you. I pray that you will speak through Phil this morning and that you will listen along with us and give us the curiosity ourselves and the insight and the courage to listen, to take it in, and to act. In Jesus' name, amen. Que la gracia y la paz de Dios sean con ustedes. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each one of you. Our scripture this morning, which we've already had dramatized for us, but it's worth hearing again, it's from Luke chapter 10. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, the lawyer said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And the, lawyer, and the lawyer said to him, oh, I'm sorry, and Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer, do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell into, into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. One of my uh, pandemic indulgences uh, in the last couple of months has been to watch 
the Netflix series The Crown. I'm just curious, who's watched The Crown? How many people have watched it? Well, not many here, as I have no idea how I'm trying to, this is sort of a representative group, so this is not a scientific survey of everybody who's watching, but it gives me a little bit of an idea uh, of how much detail to go into. And it looks like I get to go into a lot of detail because not many of you have seen, seen The Crown. The Queen in The Crown series, and it's, there are four seasons, there have been four seasons so far, uh, and it's over spanning uh, many years, so we've had two actresses play the Queen, Claire Foy at first, and then Olivia Colman uh, more recently. And the Queen's character, and I want to just really emphasize that the Crown is not a literal historical representation of events. It is a, it is a f uh, fictionalized version. So I just want to be really clear about that. So when I talk about, when I talk about the, the real people who are portrayed in the crown, uh, I, they are fictionalized. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say that these actually happened this way. But the queen in the crown is obsessed with duty and social obligation. Extremely important. The queen is obsessed with duty and social obligation. The queen, uh, as a child, she, she learns that she's going to be a queen. Her uncle abdicates the throne, and her father becomes the king. And she learns that someday she's going to be queen. And nobody says to her, nobody says to her, you can be anything you want when you grow up because she has to be the queen. There's no choice for her unless she abdicates like her horrible uncle did. She's got, to be the, she's got to be the queen. It is her duty. It is her obligation. And within that role that she's required to play and to assume uh, come uh, enormous restraints, a great deal of wealth and privilege to be sure, but enormous restraints on her in terms of the choices she's able to make in her life. And she accepts these restraints as a matter of her duty and her obligation to the common good. This is remarkable. And it's, the whole series uh, kind of portrays this, this, this tension of how these values, these very traditional conservative values of duty and social duty and obligation come into, come into contact with other values. So the queen gets so exasperated. This is one of the best parts uh, of the later seasons. The queen gets so exasperated with Charles, with Prince Charles. Just Prince Charles just drives her crazy because Prince Charles is all about expressive individualism. And there's this marvelous scene. Uh, Prince Charles has just purchased this great estate uh, this, you know, with this, these grand views and so on. And, the, and Charles fancies himself as a uh, landscape architect. And so he's showing the queen, this is my estate, and this is all I plan to do to express myself, to express who I am and my individuality. And the queen is just like, what is wrong with you? What did I do? How did I fail as a parent? And, and Charles says, well, then the tennis courts are over here. And the queen says, oh, how about those tennis courts? Do they express your individuality too? With great, uh, just dripping with sarcasm. The queen does, does, is, has these values of duty and obligation that just always are constantly pushing up against these changes in society uh, as we move more and more towards individualism. And the greatest illustration of, of this in the, sh in the crown, in the actual show, in the crown, not in real life, is the queen's relationship with Margaret Thatcher. Oh, it's one, this is wonderful. If you haven't seen season four, you should. Uh, it's just wonderful. The queen cannot stand Margaret Thatcher. This, Margaret Thatcher is even worse than Prince Charles. Margaret Thatcher is all about personal ambition and individual fulfillment. That if we all work towards our ambitions, each one of us individually, and if we all Try to, uh, try to fulfill ourselves individually, work for its personal ful fulfillment, everything will be great, and society will be great. And the queen just sort of like, what is wrong with you? 
What about duty and obligation? What about community? What's, what, what's, what's the problem here? And this gets crystallized in, 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 in a moment when Margaret Thatcher has an audience with, with the Queen, when Margaret Thatcher tries to interpret the, the text we just heard, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Margaret Thatcher somehow concludes that this parable is about personal responsibility. And if the Good Samaritan had failed to take care of himself and to amass an adequate amount of capital, he would not have been in a position to help the poor man lying by the road. And the queen just sort of looks at Margaret Thatcher like she's deranged. Um, I'll let you do what you will with that. But social solidarity, that sense that we owe each other something, that sense that we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper, as we sang earlier, matters to the queen and to Margaret Thatcher. It's nonsense. Our text here this morning, it's about social solidarity. The first century Palestine was a time when more and more people were becoming uh, marginalized socially, socially marginalized. And the, 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 the policies, the economic policies, the social policies of the Roman Empire and their, uh, their local collaborators put more and more pressure on the common people, uh, the peasantry, uh, the people who, who, who didn't have much in the way of capital, put more and more pressure, pressure on them and, it, and more and more became, uh, became to lose out. And they began to lose what they had. They began to, to feel themselves slipping. And what was happening, what Jesus saw happening, and he addresses this in so many ways in the Gospels. You really can't read the Gospels and fully understand them unless you, unless you, can, unless you have that background, that, that social context. What Jesus sees, and the lawyer seems to see this too, is that people are taking care of themselves first. I gotta take care of me and let those people worry about themselves. I see what's happening to them, and I don't want that to happen to me. So I gotta take care of me and not worry about them. And, and what, what happens then is that people lose that sense of duty and obligation in the context of community, and community begins to break down. And this is, this is, this is a big problem. So that's the background for this conversation that Jesus has with this lawyer. Now, lawyer, in this case, is not a lawyer like the two lawyers that we have in this room here. The lawyer is really kind of a biblical scholar who studies the Jewish law. I just hope you don't take offense, um, Nat or Felipe. Um, I'm just trying to, trying to help people understand this doesn't mean like a lawyer like we think of a lawyer today. A lawyer that studied the Jewish law, the Torah. And, and so, th so th that's th th they're looking at the law and trying to discern what the law means. And, and they both agree that loving God and neighbor are central to the law. The, the law is summed up in, 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 in these. That's, they all agree that a certain matter, a certain degree of social solidarity is, is, is critical. The debate is not whether there is duty and obligation under the law to love neighbor, to love God, but what exactly that means. What is required of me in my relationship with my neighbor? And, second question, which becomes the, the center of the conversation, who is my neighbor? And it, 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 it's great, Jesus says, Jesus says to the lawyer, he says, uh, what do you read in the scriptures? This is really important, actually a really important line. What do you read in the, in the scriptures? What do you see there? And the reason that's important is because the scriptures are written in Hebrew, and in Hebrew uh, there are no vowels in the written language. Obviously there are vowels 
In the spoken language, try speaking without vowels. Um, if you want to, you can give that a try. But there are vowels in the spoken language, but not the written language. And in the written language, the words for an evil one and a neighbor are the same. What do you read there? Hmm. So there's a little wordplay going on in the conversation that we miss completely. Um, but Jesus' hearers didn't miss this completely. The lawyer didn't miss this completely. But, but, but the question is asked, who is my neighbor? That is, what are the boundaries? Where's that circle of social solidarity that the, so, solidarity that the law requires of me? Who's in that? Where is that circle? And so Jesus tells this story portraying the Samaritan, the outsider, the enemy, as the one who is the neighbor, while the Jerusalem elite, the priest and the Levite, on their journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, pass by on the other side. And we've all been in that role where we've Mm, passed by on the other side. We've all been in the role where we've been the, the Samaritan. We've, we, we, we know both those roles, if, we're, if we're, we're honest. We're not all one and all the other. So we can identify with the Samaritan, and we can identify with the priest and the Levite, and we, and we ought to do that. But, but, but for Jesus, for Jesus, what's the, cru- the crucial point is that this is the law. This is the law. This is not just an act of kindness. This is the law. This is the duty and the obligation that the people have under the law. It's the force of law. It's embedded in the structure of community and society itself. Now, we often think of the law in our time, I'm, at it, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in legal theory, um, but we often think of law as sort of like pipes, sort of necessary for society to function. If we didn't have the law, we would have chaos. And so we have laws. Um, but, but for Jesus, the law, and for the lawyer too, the law is not just a functional um, kind, of, kind of institution. The law reflects the character of God. Law is, the law is the Torah given by God reflecting the character of, of, of who God is. That's, that's the law. That changes the way you think about it, doesn't it? In Christian thought, uh, we we speak about when we, when we speak about community, and we, when we speak about our relationships with others, we refer to the Holy Trinity. Like, and I, everybody's looking like, like what? What's he saying? So I'll say that again. When we speak about community as Christians. We speak about the Holy Trinity. Hmm. How do we do that? What's going on there? So what we say as as Christians about the Trinity, about God is three, or God are three, I'm not sure what is grammatically correct there, actually. Anybody ever thought about that? Um, Those of you who study, study grammar maybe can can uh, respond to that. Uh, Send me a text or an email. God is three. And Christians have said that God as three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, interact with each other. That they have a relationship of mutuality, of mutual indwelling, of regard, of mutual love and respect. That means, since God is being, God is what 
is, God is, is really what is true, God is only what is real, that means that everything that is I mean, derives its existence from God and shares in that character of community, of mutuality, of love, of, of reciprocity. That means that the relationships that we have with each other, that we have with creation, are not just functional, but they're spiritual. That there is divine mystery, that there is transcendence in them. So when the Samaritan stops, feels compassion for this stranger, this enemy, on the roadside, this Samaritan is partaking in the reality of God, is behaving in a way that is true and uniquely true. And so for Jesus, and, and I think, in his conversation with the lawyer, Jesus suggests that this behavior is a kind of prayer. It's a kind of prayer. It's a, it's, it's a mystic, sweet communion, as we sing sometimes. A mystic, sweet communion where God is present. There is something transcendent going on here. Now, my invitation to us is go and do likewise, yes, but recognizing that each of us, each of us in our day-to-day -day living engages in community, engages in some act of kindness, some act of obligation, some act of duty to somebody else. Sometimes it's somebody near, a friend, uh, a neighbor, a loved one, somebody who wouldn't, we wouldn't characterize as an enemy, a child, brother, a, a sister, a brother or sister in Christ. And sometimes it's an enemy, and sometimes it's somebody we're never going to meet. So my invitation to each of us is that we think of the ways that we, like the Good Samaritan, pray in this way. That is, when you do something for someone else or for creation, for another creature, feeding your dogs, for example, cleaning the cat box, taking out the garbage, cooking a meal, going grocery shopping, cooking a meal for your children, cooking a meal for a neighbor, cooking a meal for somebody in need, giving a gift for a birthday, putting on a mask to protect others and keep them safe and well is a kind of prayer. Getting a vaccine, if you are able to do so, is a kind of prayer. So my invitation to each one of us is to reflect on the things that we do, the interactions that we have with others out of duty, out of obligation, sometimes it might feel like drudgery, sometimes out of compassion, sometimes out of great affection and love, but each of those is a prayer. So that's my invitation to us this Lenten season in the coming week invites you to, to join in, in singing. It's number 111 in, in, the, in, the, blue, in the blue hymnal. I, I believe it's also in Voices Together. Invite, in, and I, so I invite, you to, I invite you to all join and sing. Um, and if you're present in the sanctuary, I invite you to stand. I guess you can stand if you're not here. But those of you who are here, I invite you to stand and join in song.
The Samaritan gave love, he gave compassion, he gave dignity, he gave human contact, and he gave money, enough for two months of lodging, to be precise. Giving is one of the ways that we follow Jesus' call to love our neighbors. As you give online, by sending in your checks, by passing in your offerings here in the sanctuary, you join God's work of bringing dignity and love and community and safety to the neighbors of this congregation. Give with joy.
Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we pray in many ways. We pray with our, our words, we pray with our hearts, we pray with our bodies. We ask that you make our lives instruments of your peace, places of prayer. We ask that our bodies be altars, temples, for your Holy Spirit. This part of our, our bodies, the, this offering that we return to you, we ask that it be used prayerfully in the spirit of your goodness and love. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn with us and to sing, and I completely blanked on what we're singing. What are we singing? Move in our midst, which is number 418 in the blue hymnal. It's also in Voices Together. Please join us in song. As you go out from here, remember that this is not our only time to see each other today. Come at 5 o'clock to the Memorial Garden area, and we'll have our first and hopefully only ever pandemic gras. Maybe we'll find other things to celebrate next year. Hear these words of benediction. May God bless you with the compassion of the Good Samaritan, with the wise foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world through the power of the Spirit. And may God bless you with deep love for God and for neighbor. Vayan and paz. Go in peace. <laughs>